I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Mark Gross from the Computer Science Department at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And he was describing for us a little bit before the meeting started some of his work as director of Atlas Institute at Colorado. But tonight he's gonna to tell us about HCI and the future of work. And so Mark, without further ado, let me spotlight you for everyone. Right. And I'm trying when to share you... my screen. Well. Take it away. Wow. Thank you, Nancy and Ted, who's temporarily disempowered due to electrical failures and Ed and anyone else I failed to mention. I am thrilled and delighted to be here. I was flattered when Ted invited me to join this conversation. Um, I'm a little anxious because I know that Bay Kai represents some of the sharpest minds in the Kai community, and um, I hope I'll do you justice. Uh, I am Mark Gross. I am the director of an Atlas Institute, and I'll say a little more about that in a moment, and also a faculty member in the computer science department here at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where it is one hour later in the day than it is there. Um, I also noticed as Nancy flashed through her slides, Clayton Lewis spoke here in June. Clayton Lewis is one of the founding members of the Atlas Institute back when it started in the late 1990s. And I know you had my good friend and colleague also at the Atlas Institute and computer science, Ellen Dew, fairly recently. So I hope that I won't replicate too much of what they've had to say. You won't. <laughs> I, probably not. I tried. Um, no, I mean, your, your topic, I just want to say a little bit, I'm sorry, my electricity actually failed here. <laughs> you're back. Yeah, the topic that I think is so exciting that you're touching on, um, we had Ben Schneiderman talk a little bit about the changing of HCI to mount a AI. And then in April, we're going to have another talk that is around this topic where Don Norman will be talking about a new book he's talking about, about how how the transformation of HCI is, is occurring. And I really think that this is um, really a, a great and very different take on it that you're gonna give. And I think it's just really timely and exciting for people to be realizing that we are in a transformational time, not just for other parts of society, but especially because um, as, as computers are part of every social experience today, um, it really changes how HCI interacts with with um, with with um, the world and what our profession does for it. That's enough of my my little rap. But I just thought I I, I slipped that in somehow. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad you did. Um, and you'll notice that I actually changed the order of the words in my title from the one that I gave you originally, because I realized we're really talking about not just the future of work, HCI and the future of work, but rather the future of work and HCI together. Um, I also feel a little. Um, this is slightly irresponsible because I gave you this title because I wanted to think about these questions. And I think I haven't thought as deeply as I would have liked to, um, but I'm fascinated by what's happening in the HCI community, in the Kai community. Um, so I guess I wanna say a little bit about my background before going into the talk, uh, if I can advance the slide, there you go. So there are basically three parts to what I'm going to say. I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction to myself. One, hello, I'm Mark. And then share some thoughts that are I pretty much half-baked on work in HCI, but I think they, they at least help me see where, where so we, some interesting territory that we might be going into. And then to illustrate some of that, just show some of the work that is going on at the Atlas Institute, which I'm proud and happy to have the privilege of uh, directing for the past eight years. So, and if there, if people want to interrupt with, uh, Elliot has a hand up, so I will take that now. And unmute yourself, Elliot. Uh, I, I apologize, I did not intend to raise my hand. I must have oh. tapped inadvertently. <laughs> But Mark, I have one more little thing I'd like to add, if it's all right. Yeah. Which is just in terms of who Mark is, I met Mark a, a million years ago when he was a cross-legged uh, 
God, I mean, cr cr his legs were crossed and he was sitting in front of a computer with a ponytail down to his waist, um, programming uh, Q logo. And he, he was, you know, working with Atari research and really um, with Seymour Papert and a lot of exciting people um, thinking about the future of, of computing relative to making um, the way that people interact with and learn from, uh, from computers very different from it is the beginning I, I, of, of what I know of as a very prolific career. So All right, so now that we're telling stories on each other, I'm gonna tell a story about Ted. When I was at the Atari Cambridge, so in the late 70s, early 80s, I fell in with the logo group directed by Seymour Papert at MIT. And uh, that when Seymour went off to Centre Mondial in Paris, and Mike Travers can talk about that better than I can, I'd love to hear him talk about that. Um, really? the, the logo group branched off and one of the groups started Logo Computer Systems Incorporated and we built Apple II logo. And then Alan Kay came along with Atari's money high on arcade games and said, we want to invest in education. So started two laboratories, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. And I got the privilege and fun of being part of Atari Cambridge Research in, uh, in Tech Square in, in Cambridge. And one fine day, Ted comes walking in in a really whimsical mood, as Ted is wont to be, having a, one of those pens that they used to have in checking uh, in, in banks where you, you know, go to the counter and you fill in your check. And so it was a little pen on a coil strapped to his belt. And he was raving about the future as pen computing. Well, I thought he was kind of weird, but smart and interesting. And 10 years later, I found myself working on pen computing. So I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. Um, so I started my career, well, I fell in love with programming in high school and all I wanted to do was write code. And I studied system printouts of all the DEC PDP-8s and PDP-10 um, operating systems and programming languages and applications as we now call them. And when I got to MIT, I thought I knew everything and started taking computer science classes and I was bored. And so I looked around for the other major on campus where people stayed up all night and it was in the architecture school. So I studied architecture and found myself completely flummoxed because those people weren't doing things the way math and science people did, yet they were doing something. And I became absolutely fascinated with what's going on in design and how do people design and how could machines help people design and how could we build tools to support design and designing. And that's become my sort of the, the two rivers that I've crossed between. Um, I never really became an architect, uh, but I found some really interesting territory in between. So that's the intellectual piece. And um, I keep pressing the button. There we go. So some of you may a long time ago have seen a project that I worked on for 10 or so years with my colleague, Ellen Iwendu. We called it the electronic cocktail napkin and I'm not going to show it or demonstrate it because I recently went through some of those old files and they're suffering bit rot. Uh, but the basic idea was what if you could communicate with a computer by drawing. So that's what architects do. They draw pictures and diagrams to explain their ideas. And what if um, in any domain you could recognize, the computer could recognize your drawing, your diagram and make inferences about it. This was in the days of knowledge-based systems. And so what if your drawing could inform a simulation, it could inform an expert system, it could inform a database search. Um, and so this led to a whole slew of prototype uh, hacks, I'll call them, uh, that explored this whole territory of what if computers could understand your drawings and what could you do with a system that operated like that. Um, that, that was driven by earlier attempts to build programming languages for designers and they weren't having it. They, because the interface needed to be the pencil. Another big piece of my life was working with Eric Schweikart, my former PhD student and now business partner in a company called Modular Robotics. And uh, Eric's PhD thesis was originally called Roblox, which we got a cease and desist order sometime close to the beginning of the company. Uh, we called it Cubelets, and each of these little blocks has a microcontroller. The black blocks are sensor blocks and the clear blocks are action blocks. So you can sense distance, you can sense temperature, you can sense light, and you can act by lighting a flashlight or playing a sound. 
um, doing all these things. And it's designed for children, but there's a subversive idea in it. And that is that there's no brain block. There's no God block. There's no central program. The, the robot you assemble is itself the program that determines its behavior. So each of the sensor blocks produces a number. It transmits the number based on its sensor input to its neighbors. It propagate, the numbers propagate through the network formed by the adjacencies of the blocks, and then they output on the clear blocks. Um, so the subversive idea here is that we don't have global warming because somebody programmed it. We have global warming because it's a whole bunch of local interactions that produce a global effect. And that's the subversive idea we're trying to convey through this toy to children. We never did the, uh, the follow-up to see whether playing with the toy does in fact produce this intuition in children. We were inspired by Valentino Breitenberg's book, Vehicles, which if you don't know, you should read. It's a Sunday afternoon, two hour read, and it's absolutely beautiful. And just to give you an idea of what cubelets are like, there's you know, many, many videos on the web of the show, a really short one. So there's a lot of those out there. And we took it to, uh, we, we did this all in the lab at Carnegie Mellon where I was working at the time. And um, we started getting calls from museums that said, hey, we hear you've got this kit. Can we show it in our robots exhibit next month? And we're like, no. Well, we sat down one day and said, I guess we should start a company. So we did. Took it to Maker Faire in 2010 or 11. And we knew it was a success when the kids just swarmed the table for the whole three days. So that was really fun. And oh, I don't want to play that again. Let's see if I can go forward. Yeah. So I'm giving you selected views onto where I've been and how I got here. So another one was with Gabe Johnson, again, his PhD thesis at Carnegie Mellon, where I worked for a decade or so. And here the idea was, gee, uh, learning to use CAD systems, even the simplest ones, is a fairly steep learning curve. And what if you could just draw and, uh, and the drawing would behave according to the way you intend, and then you could send it to a laser cutter or maybe even a 3D printer later. So I'll just let the video play because I think it says it better than I'll be able to explain. all the traditional geometric figures and diagrams. This is, this is one of those cases where I thought the product, the, the program was really great. Uh, Gabe Johnson was a good software engineer. He wasn't a good business person. And so company ran out of money and closed, um, even though we had good prospects for customers. And uh, I'm kind of sad about that, but I, I, love the, I love the idea. Oh, no, not again. Uh, okay, so now my project for the last eight years has been making the Atlas Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder something really fun and great for people. This is partly because all my life other people have made space for me to play and hack and have my ideas and, and execute on them. 
And now I happen to be in the position to be able to do that for others. And so I've taken on a mid-level administrative role, which involves a lot of boring crap that I don't love, but the, the reward is seeing the work that students and faculty members do uh, with the resources that I'm able to give them. We're situated right here in Boulder at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. This is our building. The canopy on top has colored LEDs in it. And so at night you can light it up and play patterns on it. Um, I started, I took the job eight years ago when I was still in startup land with these companies. And uh, the former director is moving on to his next lily pad and people at this university started saying, hey, you know, Mark Gross should be the next director. So eventually they called me and, uh, and they said, are you interested? And I said, no, I just left a really great engineering school. I'm having fun out here making products that actually might reach people, uh, but I'm interested to bowl. And let me roll back and say that the Institute was started in the late 1990s by the then chancellor of the university and the CIO, Bobby Schnabel, who some of you may recognize from ACM world. Uh, and the idea then was that, hey, this internet thing looks like it might be big and maybe this university should play. And at the time also, um, there were not computational chemists and computational astrophysics physicists. Disciplines were fairly siloed without computing, but they realized that computing was gonna cross into all the disciplines and become part of all of our lives. And so they started this institute with that idea and it began academically as uh, a small set of classes in technology, arts and media that became really popular. It became a major, uh, it became a minor and then there was a master's program that grew up and then a small doctoral program interdisciplinary. When I came on in 2014, there was a minor, very popular with about six or 700 students taking classes in technology, arts and media and uh, a small master's program in ICT for development and a PhD program that was really radically interdisciplinary, but there were no faculty members in the Atlas Institute that did research. And I said, well, wait a minute, institutes at this university are supposed to be research institutes and unlike departments, they cross the discipline. So they sort of, if the departments and colleges are vertical, the institutes are cross. And so this is the place where radical interdisciplinary work can and should happen. And so when they asked me if I wanted to run this thing, I said, well, only if you'll give me some runway and um, I'm interestable, made them a modest proposal to do some faculty hires and uh, launch, they turned the minor into a major. Amazingly, I don't think they knew what they got, but uh, they hired me and I've been having fun making things happen ever since. So at the end, towards the end of this talk, I'll share with you some of what's going on, but there's no way I could capture all of it. So just give you a flavor. Um, the little logo on the right that's GIF that keeps flickering the A's is meant to signify that there's constant change and diversity in our program. I guess I should also say that one of the more diverse uh, demographic programs in the College of Engineering. All right, so with that, I wanted to say a few things about humans, computers, and work. And I realized that probably this is irresponsible in some sense arrogant of me to say these things because I'm no expert in the future of work. And uh, so with that, forgive me. I want to remember uh, Barbara Ehrenreich, who passed away recently, is one of the great thinkers of work and society in America. And she's probably best known for nickel and dimed in a, a, an account of when she went undercover as a worker in you know, service, housekeeping and restaurants and wrote about the experience of working in these uh, underpaid, underappreciated jobs. Um, so if you don't know Barbara Ehrenreich, um, I commend her to you. And uh, as I started to think about, well, who are experts in the future of work, geez, um, I can't hold a candle to people like Harley Shaken, who's in your neck of the woods. And so I'm just saying these things to know, to say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm a new kid in this and I'm learning. And the reason I wanted to give this talk is that I wanted to think about these things. Am I making sense, people? Sure. Can I get a, can I get a yes? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yep. So here is a diagram that National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health and NIOSH prepared in their uh, review of the future of work. And I mean, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, um, 
but it wasn't obvious until I saw the diagram. The future of work involves three, the Venn diagram of three things. It involves the work itself, the workers or the workforce, the people who do the work, and the place in which it happens or the workplace. So it seems kind of trivial, but it's actually, I found it a good way to think about um, where, things, where things are. So we'll start, this is probably, I didn't check the date and notice it's the Scientific American, uh, an illustration of an early counting machine, an electrical counting machine. So this is sort of the first round of automation interacting, humans interacting with uh, calculating machines, computing machines. Notice who's sitting at the, at the desk. It's not an accident that it's like that. Go into the 1940s and sort of, uh, now you have photographs and uh, it's census tabulating machines. So this is a physical activity. You're seated at a desk or a table. There's a bunch of people around you doing like you're doing. And this is what human computer interaction was in, in those early days. This is where I came in, in the sort of 1967, 68. I was introduced to this amazing little machine that was in a closet in my high school, connected to a regional high school that had a PDP-8 computer. And this is where I fell in love with programming. Um, same model, basically, you're sitting in front of a machine, you're interacting now through a typewriter, that was an, a substantial innovation, and there's hard copy. So we had no screen, we just had paper, rolls of paper, and the output device was paper tape, and you could use that same paper tape to put your program back in. Um, so this was actually, you know, for me, this is sentimental, this was in a, the, the moment when I felt like I became an adult, even though I was only 13 or something, because now I could actually uh, perform real work. And as soon as I found this, I wanted to tell all my high school buddies about the amazing things. I wanted to, I was a proselyte for, uh, oh, you could write programs to compose music. Oh, you could write programs to translate uh, into foreign languages. Oh, you could write simulations of history. So that was my high school. Um, but it always involved sitting in a little closet in front of this clatter clatter machine that was producing graphics, if you like, by overstriking characters. Uh, or fun patterns on the paper tape. Um, but it's the same model. Now, flash forward another 20 or so years, and we still kind of have the same model. This is the Symbolics List Machine. This is where we had what we had at, uh, at Atari Cambridge Research. But really, you're still sitting in front of the machine, interacting with the keyboard, looking at a screen now, and the screen is monochrome. We hadn't yet got to full color displays very much. They weren't, they weren't the norm. Um, but still the same basic model of interacting. So to summarize so far, since the beginning of HCI, which once upon a time was called man-machine interaction, um, you pick a date when you want to call a start, but HCI has mostly been about so-called knowledge workers, people uh, who aren't out doing physical labor. They're manipulating information, they're manipulating knowledge, and so there are corresponding implications for the workplace itself. Um, you sit in front of a machine, one-to-one -one relationship. And sort of here's the extreme implication of that. You have rooms full of people sitting in front of machines separated from one another, interacting one-to-one -one with their computer. And this, I mean, things can get messier than this, but this is kind of the spatial implication of that interface that we lived with for so many years. So I mentioned Ted walking into Atari Cambridge Research with a fake pen strapped to his waist. And he indeed forecast a future, which was in the early 1990s, pen computing became a thing. And it was still, you're still interacting with a display, but no longer a keyboard. And so one of the phrases, I think Bill Buxton said it at least once, throw away the keyboard. Um, now you can interact with a pen. Of course, that, that skipped the beat about how is the computer going to know what you what you meant when you draw? And that's where I got fascinated with drawing recognition, sketch recognition, and applications of AI to recognition. So this was kind of a passing fancy because it was soon replaced by uh, 
integrating the display and the input device, but there was a, a moment and it's still used in specialized domains like uh, graphic, graphic design, where people use Wacom tablets to, uh, to edit uh, their work. But that sort of didn't become the future that some of us thought, oh, wow, that might happen. Although you could argue that the tablet computers that we have today are kind of the successor of that. So then pick a day, you know, where, where do you think it began? We got mobile and we know the reasons for that, but there were huge implications for workplace and workers and a whole bunch of new HCI or user interface, user experience concerns, because no longer are we sitting in front of a screen, sitting in front of a screen, interacting through the keyboard and mouse, but rather we're on the go. Maybe we hold it in our hand. Uh, and so that implies new workers, new kinds of locations, all kinds of other concerns that happen when you're no longer in a controlled situation. Sort of a, a brief reminder, the Apple Newton, a failed product in a way, but one of the first, maybe not the first, that I'm not sure, succeeded by the Palm Pilot. And so you can see the buttons come and go, the keyboards come and go, remember the BlackBerry. Um, and I'm not sure what to make of the latest iteration of these things, but these are all mobile screen-based interactions. Uh, so rather different experience than, than the one that I grew up with, certainly, and um, with pretty radical implications. So your delivery worker, your UPS person, your FedEx person is carrying around one of these. I'm not sure if this is the current version. Keyboard's back, screen's there, um, but notice that we're no longer a knowledge worker, really. We're a delivery person, and that's huge. The, the implications of mobile brings a whole new set of workers into the mix and a whole new set of workplaces that we just hadn't seen before. Um, I showed you that reminder of the different mobile devices or PDAs to phones because we're now looking at head-mounted displays and the what happens when augmented and virtual reality becomes part of the mix, again, with corresponding implications for all the future of work, the work itself the workplace and the workers. So here we go with Ivan Sutherland's early work in the mid 1960s on head mounted displays, the failed Google Glass, but remember the Apple Newton failed too. And sure enough, we can really expect uh, head mounted displays to become a thing again. It already is, here's the Unreal, which is one of the more recent implementation of head mounted displays. And we're using it in a project I'll show you in just a second. Um, but people tend to think, oh, Google, Google Glass failed, partly for social reasons. Um, but I think we can be pretty sure that we're going to see a whole realm of, of head-mounted displays and virtual reality, augmented reality devices. So I'm going to transition now to talk about work that's going on here in Colorado at the Atlas Institute Laboratories. We're a confederation of different labs, each run by a faculty member. So I won't name all the people, but you'd recognize some of the names. And this, this list changes as people come and go. What I wanted to show was talking again about head-mounted displays and virtual reality. Um, this is work literally done last week in the right direction. Yep. Um, what happens to the workplace when it isn't any one place, when it's people collaborating in augmented reality? So um, this, is, this is what we're doing right now and it's work with Ellen Dew and her students and our colleague Amy Banich from the University of Wyoming, sponsored by Erickson Research, so thank you there. So here's party one and party two. Upper right, you can see we're pasting in the remote image into, into overlaid in the augmented reality scene. So it really calls into question, where are we? And how do we present the remote person?
Can you tell us what they're trying to do or what they're accomplishing, please? Well, sure. What, they're not accomplishing anything yet. We, we're not going for a task. We've done some previous work with jamming in, uh, jamming over the internet using virtual reality and augmented reality to provide a sense of presence. These are really just technical checks to see how well we can embed remote video feed or remote uh, um, point cloud into the, into the other person's sense so that they can collaborate in one way or another. But it's about providing a sense of presence that um, seems to be seems to be quite. I know there's a lot of work on this, but it seems to be quite difficult. So what, all you're looking at is technical rushes. Does that help? Sure. So here's a, another instance. Um, this really is hot off the press, and come back in a week, it'll be different. So here we're we're plugging him into what you're looking through the the uh, AR glasses and you're seeing whatever's happening on the camera. So how would we put Rishi into the picture? So I'm, I'm saying this because I'm really puzzled as to how we should be doing this and, and what effects it's really going to have in use. And hard enough is to actually present this in a video because what am I looking at? So workplace was really easy when we were talking about the desktop computer, we we're talking about screens, we we're talking about mobile. We're now, where is there? It's not even clear there is a there. It's some weird mix of here and the other place. And so how do we provide a sense of place for mobile, for, for phones and screens? We have pretty standard gestures. We know pinch, we know swipe. I don't think there have yet been a set of standard gestures. There's been different ones proposed for different platforms, but we don't yet have global agreement about how to interact in virtual and augmented reality with our hands and with our bodies. There are hardware and device ergonomics challenges like to wear these things, what's it like, and do they fall off your nose? Or uh, And then generally, because we're now interacting over the internet in, uh, in attempted real time with pretty substantial uh, bandwidth issues. What do you do about inherent network latency? So in the, in the musical jamming situation, it's really critical because um, musicians are pretty sensitive to even 30 millisecond delays. And so in that work, we looked at how can we fool the ear with, with visuals and avatars, uh, even though the audio is actually kind of raw. So there are HCI challenges around, you know, speed of light isn't gonna, isn't gonna change. And so how are you gonna deal with internet latency when you need real time presence in an augmented reality situation? Um, another topic that I've had the pleasure of playing with is e-textiles and wearables and debugging. So I've been teaching a class on wearables um, for a few years. And uh, we happened into a project with Yasmin Kafai and her group at Penn uh, working with kids in the LA school system, school district, although we've been only focusing on the technology there, working with the kids, um, to have people design and, and debug e-textiles. Um, the lily pad Arduino was, came out of this university. Leah Beakley was here as a PhD student in computing back in the early 2000s. And uh, so two projects coming up are, uh, are a result of the e-textile work. I've been, I've been fascinated with debugging for a long time. Like uh, it's, it's something we learn, but we don't teach very well. And the debuggers, what's a debugger look like for an e-textile or for a lily pad or a, a embedded computing? So here's the thread board. And this is largely the work of Chris Hill's work, one of our PhD students. And the challenge is that teaching beginners about embedded computing with the traditional breadboard is really hard because there's a lot going on behind the breadboard that you can't see. And so you have to teach them how the wires work that are invisible. So the idea here was, uh, and, and they don't work very well with uh, e-textile things like conductive thread. So here the idea is you're using a set of magnets that are laid out on a board that make the physical connections and the electrical connections to your microcontroller and to your devices that you can they later transfer into 
a wearable uh, that you're making, which the kids do. So here's the quick video. It turns out that conductive thread is magnetic. So we now use this in our introduction to wearable computing. Kids, you know, we use it in workshops with kids. It works quite well to get them into the mix before they have to deal with uh, the more conventional electronics components. And so that's the physical part. And then the next project in that same stream, if I can not do that. So this one's a little hard to follow and I'll try to walk you through it before I press play. Um, what's going on here is we have a, uh, a circuit playground, which is like a lily pad Arduino. And the challenge is if you're beginning, you don't really know what the pin values are coming in and out of these devices. So this is a debugger to help you see what's going on in your electronics. On the lower right, you'll see a video feed of the actual device. Um, the upper items there let you select which pin you're looking at and show you as an output device whether the pin is high or low and what's going on there. So it goes by pretty quick. So we're You can see the values fluctuating. So the reason, the reason I like this is usually when you're trying to debug e-textile or in general embedded systems, but in particular e-textiles, you end up having to write code and put debug statements and print statements. And so that requires a level of sophistication in programming that not all beginners have. Now, this has its own set of challenges, technical challenges, but it gives you a direct readout as to what your device is doing. And again, we're no longer in the screen world, right? E-textiles, uh, don't have screens. You're not programming them. You program them on a screen, but then you run them and you debug them without the benefit of a visible text output device. So that to me is something valuable that this is doing. Gum, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So when you say debugging, I think of, you know, checking if the program's working, introspection about what it's doing, um, you know, and then seeing what its output and input is relative to what you expected. Um, can, uh, can, can, you know, can you kind of, I, I feel, I'm, how is this, how is this, uh, how do I look at the program? What, I'm not even sure what the program is exactly. I know what the connections are, but how is, um, right, 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 right. This is this is not the software debugger. This is the hardware debugger. 
So if my program is not behaving, embedded systems are hard because is the bug in the hardware? Is the bug in the software? Is the bug in some combination or interaction between the hardware and the program? Don't know. So this debugger in particular is to help you understand what the hardware is doing. If you have a failed component, if your LED is uh, connected with the reverse polarity, uh, is the temperature sensor actually producing values? So this is not about the code, this is ab about debugging the hardware. Very important, interesting, yes. Yeah, I, I, I should have, I should go on probably about the various kinds of bugs and, and experiences that people have when in, in debugging, um, but it really is, you know, the first thing they do is they rip their circuit apart and try over again, which is kind of sad. And, and it's a lot of labor and effort um, that gets wasted that way. So the idea here is to help people understand what's going on in their microcontroller before they take their circuit apart. And, and it gives an incremental um, feedback as well. Mm -hmm. And that incremental feedback, even if you tear it all apart and put it all back together, you don't have, you know, you're just lucky if you were more careful as opposed to recognizing all of the parts are working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, so another feature of tomorrow's world or today's world is robots. Um, we've had a fair amount of work going on here around interacting with robots. And you could say human robot interaction is really human computer interaction, but there's this whole physical mechanical component to it as well. So, this is a pretty simple one to hear the, uh, hear the idea is you're, all right, so imagine you're in a video game and so you've got your headset on and you, you just see what's being shown to you. This adds haptics. So you, uh, you want to sit down on, on your throne because you're the queen or the king. The little robot will come and deliver a chair under your butt just in time to give you the sense of actual real haptics. So it's a Roomba and a laundry rack. So now you can feel the walls around you. It's a, a human powered version of that. said that I'm not really a card carrying Kai member, but somehow this work ends up in Kai conferences and I'm quite sure how that happens. Um, I had another one which I wanted to share here. That was room shift. And... Yeah. I thought I had another one, but I don't remember now. Yeah, so um, that was the mechanics of that worked, um, but he was driving those robots around by hand. And so how do you program or train a swarm of robots to interact with people in a scene? Uh, programming language for that, uh, real-time issues for that, a whole bunch of kind of unexpected 
challenges in, in interacting with people? What if you have a swarm of people and a swarm of robots? So this was only a dozen of those uh, Roombas. Like they're still kind of pricey, but what would you, what, how would you do? But, keep looking for that missing video. Oh, here it is. So similar set of issues. I won't play the whole four minute video, but to give you a sense about what's going on. So this is not room scale, but tabletop scale. And again, a fairly small number of these things. Individually controlled, but now connected in some fashion. stop it there but you get the idea yeah so again pretty good engineering on the little robots but not a lot of thought about how you're going to control them and what if you don't have 10 but you have 100 or you have a thousand so i know work's going on in those things but that's an another we're no longer in the world of interacting with a screen or a mouse or a keyboard we're interacting with a swarm of these little uh, some intelligence built into them creatures. And so what's the programming language for that look like? All right. Um, drones. Human was fascinated by uh, the Hoberman sphere and using it to keep people safe from drones and keep drones safe from one another. Drones can be dangerous to people and themselves. We present Pufferbot, an expandable aerial robot which adjusts its size to accommodate its environment. Near obstacles, it can expand to obscure any moving parts to protect the people in the environment. To protect the robot, and avoid damage to its surroundings. It can also potentially be used as a way to signal to the user to not get close to the robot, similar to animals in the wild. The collapsible structure also has the potential to reduce impact speed and damage to the environment. Yeah, so we're getting weirder and weirder, right? We're, we've moved from sort of fairly traditional HCI concerns to robots and human robot interaction and is this even really hci well but it ends up kind of in the kai world too um this one may be closer to, to, to traditional hci this is peter jury's work so i think he's hope he'll be finishing his phds really soon i'll just show you what he's got this was presented just last or summer at uh, Creativity and Cognition. A different strategy this time. I personally view video games as just another form of media, like a book or a movie. When you have a storytelling medium that's been around 
for a little bit, as games finally have been, you get to start having these experiences, which are like the postmodern things. They're playing with what does it mean to play a game? And that's exciting to me. Tiny Cave is a DIY arcade machine that you can make with just recycled materials like cardboard or toothpicks. Uh, and it's designed to be a platform for people to build their own little tiny retro arcade games at home. The only actual technology here is a cell phone. Uh, so we use the main screen as the display for the game uh, and the cameras on the back as the means to sense what's going on. So this marker is like home. That's my reference point. And I was trapped at home during the pandemic and I didn't have access to the normal fabrication tools I would have. Uh, and in my own work, I like to make game controllers for playing. So my thought was, why don't I make a thing that other people could potentially build at home? Um, and I figured given the system we already had, I could do it in an afternoon. And that's how long it took me to get the first prototype together. Anything you could find at a grocery store or a hardware store is an acceptable material for Tinycade. Anything you have to custom order from a special supplier, that's a no-go. I want to open this up not just for designers, but players to be able to rethink what might their interface for a game look like. I'd like to see that space open up a little bit more. I think I want to wrap this up fairly soon in the interest of time, if that makes sense. Give me a nod if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Your choice. A different strategy this time. I, I guess oh. I want people to recognize that the mirror is letting the, the camera in that cell phone look at the the cardboard moving around that the person is controlling with. Right. It's the AR markers on the back, and uh, we're we're encouraging people to experiment with different making their own controllers. So what I like about that is that regular ordinary people can make stuff and make their own design their own interactions um all right i'll just share a couple more because this one's crazy this is kaylee she's originally a chemist and an electrical engineer and a lego fanatic so she is building devices that automate chemistry laboratories and her first version was this lego device which is absolutely insane i couldn't believe it would work until she built it so it's transporting liquids and powders and mixing them she got really far on this draft and so she was pretty stingy with video because um, she's making this into a company and hoping to go to market in the next couple of years And here's the next version, which is more pro. So now the question is, how are you going to program the sequences of operations? I mean, apart from all the fancy mechanical engineering, electrical engineering that goes on in this device, how are you going to program the reactions that you want? What's the language for doing that? So you, you've brought this question up several times, and it's a very important question. And at the beginning of the robot field, which, you know, um, the, the big breakthrough was hand over hand training of the six degree of freedom robots. That is that you'd put it in programming mode and show it a path to go through, and then it would copy that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that was very um, visceral. It had lots of feedback. It was easy to teach a person how to teach a robot. And um, that was, you know, 1980, that was a uh, robot, um, whatever, um, Unimation, Unimat, uh, Unimation West, um, 1980, I don't know, three. What have we done since then? What is, what is some amazing um, improvement over that? Because you're talking about debugging and programming mm -hmm. for all of these very tangible things. And um, do, you have, do we have any, is that really the good best idea or do we have better ideas now? Boy, I don't know. And I hope that someone in the room has ideas. 
I'm always fascinated by how people can convey their intent and desires into a machine because that's the power of, so Ted, I don't have an answer. Um, I, think, I think we're in really new territory here. I mean, I want, I want to close my part of this by just sort of seeing a lot of work going on in the Kai community that no longer has seems to have a computer in it. And so it's fascinating, it might be fabrication, it might be robotics, but where's the computer? And so are we still in Kai land? Um, here's one. I'll show you two, this, they're both short. Um, and so people aren't really focusing on the computing part of it. They're focusing on the mechanics part about the physics part of it, the materials part of it. Really cool output device. Clearly a part of some kind of interaction of the future. Here's the computer. And then just to go kind of all the way, let's skip that one. I'll close with this video and then a couple of remarks if this video plays. So to close, so what? Boundaries are changing. Kai is not what it used to be. I read papers, I find them fascinating. I cannot find the, the computer in it. And I'm not even sure about the interaction, but it's interesting work. So NSF, I feel like maybe the name will change and it's more like what NSF is calling the human technology frontier because it's no longer about straight computing. Punchline, after decades of sitting in front of screens, interactive technologies are now out there in all kinds of ways with huge implications that I just can't even feature uh, for, the work, for the workers and for the workplace. And oh, by the way, we're hiring. So if you know someone who's looking for an academic job, um, go there quick. And thank you. And I will quit sharing. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we get a couple of questions? Uh, I know that uh, Mike Travers was called out earlier. Maybe you want to start with something? Sure. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, how, you know, 
what 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 how you actually do program these these you know ro robot these robots and other distributed systems i mean i i did some work on that decades ago and i'm wondering what what what's the what's the current state of the art in doing things like that so this, this is the the pleasure of my work these days is that i get to make things happen let other people do things I don't have the answers because I'm no longer doing it. And that's also the, the sadness of my, like what I miss most in, in my previous life is programming because I love to program. I don't get to do that anymore. Maybe I will again someday. So please do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so I wish I knew the answer. Um, I, and I don't think there are good answers out there yet. Well, I'm seeing, looking at your friends list, but abstract. That's okay. That's. Yeah, I also did some stuff with chemistry robots, um, also also decades ago. But uh, the, no, no Legos, but uh, same idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what do students go on to do that are part of these projects? Yeah, so it's it's kind of like the Media Lab. They go all kinds of places. Right. It's not it. You know, the, the undergraduate students, many of them go on to software engineering jobs or UI UX jobs. But when I look at where they go, the graduate students, uh, the usual about 20 percent go on to academic jobs. Um, about 20 percent of the master's students go on to doctorates. Um, but the range is pretty big. Some of it's domain driven. So like Kaylee's going to go into a startup for her or for her organic chemistry machine. Um, Peter's gonna go probably teach games somewhere, although he probably wants to keep his hand in the actual game building industry. So yeah, it, it, it's a hard question to answer when people, you know, I can say they all get good jobs and they're all using what they learned and did in our program, but it's not like there's one track. And I think that's both the beauty and the difficulty. And uh, in that regard, could you kind of maybe even highlight a couple of the, you know, um, heroes that have um, that you're really proud of, and you're kind of, you know, some some children that you're yeah that you're kind of watch watching. Sure. Their, you know. one, one of my favorites is Hyunju Oh at uh, Georgia Tech. Favorites because she worked with me and Mike Eisenberg before he passed away, and. Uh, it, it's uh, the kit is called uh, paper mechatronics, and so it's for children and learners to learn mechanical engineering by designing in a simulated environment on the screen in a web interface, and then printing it out on a laser cutter and assembling it. And kids built amazing things, so that was really cool. She worked with Sherry Shi, who some of you may know from your neck of the woods, and uh, now she's on the faculty in industrial design and computing at Georgia Tech, um, making a great name for herself. So I'm, I'm super proud and happy of her, partly because I had a hand in her growth and development, um, but partly just because she does really cool work. And then I, I guess I want to um, point out that when I visited, one of the things you do is you have a little bit of a, a party every now and then where you kind of show off and, 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 and challenge and inspire people that come through and what I um uh music's always seems to be part of part of the mix and you have these drums that you oh my god uh, that you um you know were part of the part of the story is that is there any simple way for you to share the video of that to show people with that 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 uh yeah so one of the strange artifacts of the building that was made in 2006 is we have a black box theater and, and studio. And we had a big flood a couple of years ago. So we got to re-outfit all the kit, motion capture and surround sound, the ambisonic spatial audio and 3D projection, and all the cool whizzies. And that's attracting people who want to do performing arts and music with it. Most recent hire is Grace Leslie, who does brain computer interfaces, brain body music and wellness. And so she just arrived in September, but I'm pretty sure she's going to do some amazing stuff around audio and sound. And one of the, I'm hoping to recruit people. So computer music is 
of the arts, the oldest and strongest, dating back to the 1950s. Visual arts are catching up, but the sound people have just been doing amazing work for decades. And so it's always, I'm not a musician, but it's always been a fascination of mine that doing stuff with music and computing. So I'm, I'm hoping we attract uh, a stream of people who want to do that now that we have all the equipment and, and we have a couple of faculty members who are expert in it. Um, is there anybody else that wants to ask a question or say something? Or holler at me offline. Jaren. I was just uh, thinking about this conversation I had earlier today. I'm going to read you a little bit of the text from it, where we were, uh, several of us were talking about um, the Washington Post's recent article about, it says, perspective inside Zuckerberg's, Zuckerberg's $1,500 headset, $1, headset, the metaverse is still out of reach. And uh, so the question of the group was, uh, is the metaverse out of reach? Who is going to be using these things for anything? And so one person pointed out that the killer apps currently are all industrial, oil rig repairs, uh, industrial assembly harnesses, or nuclear power training, and so on. And they all benefit from mixed reality digital overlays onto the real world, or the physical world, right? And this person says he's testing uh, six different VR headsets in a Horizon workroom. <clears throat> of course, the model he's got has been discontinued. But anyway, it's tr he's trying to figure out whether this uh, the mixed reality implementation is a better way for six people to sit in the same virtual room instead of having to get to a physical room. And what, what are the advantages to them for doing that? So he's in the mid midst of this experiment with these six different headsets. And so we'll ho we hope we're going to find something out in a couple months about, he says, uh, for example, the engineers have found the experience helpful in doing code reviews and paired programming. So, you know, there yeah. is, there was some, um, I had a student at, um, at MIT Media Lab two years ago, uh, uh, Mike Greenwood, um, who, who um, did an experiment to demonstrate that the <coughs> VR um, teaching of physics, some physics things he'd made, was better, had better results than doing it on big screen. So there are now very few, but some examples. There's one uh, about... Um, training people to, to uh, run a piano. But most of the successes that make money in the VR, um, AR space have been uh, people having lists of things that they're going through as they're walking up and down aisles or putting something together. So it's really this, uh, this uh, you know, it's really a memory aid that this thing is allowing you to, to do. And the whole mixed reality thing, I don't know how many successes that are, that are actually making money for anybody that are that are working yet. So that's one one comment on what you were just saying, Nancy. I don't know. Probably Mark, you yeah. have some of the things to I'm, say. Yeah, I mean the it seems a, a big distinction whether it's me and a device and an artifact or me and you and a device and an artifact. And I think a lot of the applications so far have been repair and diagnostics, but that's me and an artifact. But how do we create a shared space and a shared place? So I'm, I guess I'm techno-optimistic that there will be really interesting things to happen in the future. I'm also techno-pessimistic to expect that all kinds of social ills will occur if we're not cautious about uh, what we're doing and what we allow our big tech uh, overlords to do. <laughs> well, certainly we are right here, right now, uh, using computers for human, human communication. And I think that all that people really care about are other people mostly and interacting with them. So that's my, my position on some of this. Well, maybe that's a good place to end. Oh, we have one hand up, Brandel. Yeah. Brandel, yeah. Um, so um, forgive me if this isn't fully baked yet. Um, so. In information work, uh, we 
produce all of the media uh, that we work with in a way that's perfectly legible to the computer. In contrast, as you said, here we are in human human work, uh, if you call this work, um, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so the legibility of it for the computer is irrelevant. Uh, when you talk about workplaces uh, becoming uh, increasingly dominated by uh, computing, uh, it uh, but it's not information work, then it, it sort of bleeds into this third uh, sort of category where people are doing things that are incidental to the relevance to the computer, but it's necessary for the computer to be able to understand that. Computing is sort of the, the discipline of formalism and uh, strict identifiability of things. And so um, computers are really bad at those spaces. Do you see that as being something that is getting better enough to be able to do the work we need them to? Mm. Yeah, I, that's, that's a four beer conversation. Uh, that, where you led me to was an example of, say, a construction worker who's wearing a device or a suit that notices whether they are attending to their surroundings, how, how situationally aware are they. So I don't know that there's explicit symbolic recognition there, although probably deep down in the software there is, but that's not visible to the worker or the workers or the people around them. And so the computing is kind of buried in the device in a way that um, you could ignore the computing, it becomes, but you can't because it actually is the function of the device. So I lost track of your question, but, or, or the, the challenge, um, but I, I guess I, I do think that's all getting better in the sense that there will be clothing that is aware of what I'm doing and whether that's good or bad, we can argue, but I think it's pretty bad right now, but I, I bet you in 10 years. We can hope. Oh. Um, with that, um, I think that uh, um, you know Mark's goal in what he does at University of Colorado and also in this setting is more to provoke and ask good questions and make people think and 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 hopefully want to explore and 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 ignite their curiosity more than to answer all of the questions. And maybe I'm wrong, but that's that's my interpretation. Um, and and I and I really hope that everybody enjoyed seeing and listening to Mark as I did. Um, and with that, I I bid you a good evening and uh, appreciate all of the time and effort you put into putting this together, Mark. Thank you all for the opportunity <laughs> to have this conversation and send me great people, please. <laughs> That's, that's what I live for. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm not doing it for my health. I'm doing this to surround myself with people who are smarter than me and crazier than me. And it's working so far. So thank you again. Good night. Thank you, Mark. Thanks.